let's start off with some numbers. We like numbers. Ducati sells somewhere around 490 million US dollars worth of motorcycles a year. Now these are old figures, but let's run with them. Yamaha sells about twice that much, hovering around a billion dollars worth. And Honda makes that amount look tiny, selling bikes to the tune of $5.6 billion a year. Even if the majority of those aren't the world's most exciting machines. Now, let's not forget, Yamaha is also pretty big in musical instruments and electronics and audiovisual. And Honda has that whole car thing happening. Ducati sells caps and jackets. These Japanese companies are big. They can write big checks and they really don't like being embarrassed on the racetrack. But in 21 years of World Superbike, where manufacturers take their best production sports bikes, hot them up and then go racing, Ducati has been ridiculously dominant. Take a look down the list of championship winning riders. 13 out of 21 champions, one riding a Ducati. The manufacturer's title is even more telling. Ducati's won no less than 16 manufacturer's titles. The closest competitor's Honda, with just four. These cheeky Italians have been publicly spanking the biggest motorbike companies in the world for more than 20 years on a shoestring budget. And whether or not the capacity rules give the cappuccino burners a bit of an advantage, that's a pretty amazing achievement. The latest Ducati Superbike is the 1198, but let's rewind a bit. The 916 was designed by Massimo Tamburini in 1994, and it's still regarded as one of the prettiest bikes ever made. It was a tough act to follow for Pierre Turblanche when he got the unenviable job of designing the 999 in 2003. Now, the 999 was an odd-looking bike at the best of times, and it had a nice tailpiece, but it looked like a bag of arse next to its predecessor. So, Turblanche got relegated to road bikes, and in 2006, it fell to young designer Giandria Faboro to reinvent the Ducati Superbike. He kept Turblanche's tail idea, and in his own words, went for something much pointier than before. And boy did he kick a goal. If you're at work, you might want to pop a thick folder over your lap for just a minute. Just try to find an angle that makes this bike look anything less than incredible. Oh wait, there we go. That looks a bit ordinary. Hang on, hang on, zoom in on that frame well. It looks like someone's wrapped bubblegum around it. I'm sorry, that's just plain hot. Ducati fans are going to tell you that red's the only colour you should be even thinking of, but in my opinion the white is pure sex. Just a hint of pearl in there to accentuate the bike's fine lines. You'll want to carry a cloth around with you though, because every speck of dirt feels kind of like a turd on your carpet. Ducati's clearly thought of this because you'll notice that if you fold a chuck swipe in just the right way, you can actually fit it under the seat. It's practical! That'll also come in handy for the various different body fluids that seem to come shooting involuntarily out of bystanders. So it's got the looks. Well, how does it ride? Our first day of road testing was a shocker, bucketing with rain. Hardly the kind of day you're hoping for when you're straddling a road-registered nuclear bomb that weighs 170 kilos and makes 170 horsepower. Seriously, it's insulting to ask a horse to pull one kilo of anything around. But riding the Duke in the wet highlighted one of its strongest features, the brilliant throttle setup and engine mapping. A lot of competitors have multiple engine maps because they're too full on in the wet, but the 1198's throttle is so nice and progressive that you really don't feel like you need a nano mode. The Morelli injection comes in creamy smooth off a closed throttle, with no snatch or jerk at all, and it's downright civilised and classy when it needs to be. I was able to wrestle this thing around all day in the wet without losing traction once, and that says a lot. Mainly it says that I'm a giant petunia and I wasn't giving it enough berries, but hey. This is a good time to mention traction control. The 1198R and S models both come with an 8-stage Ducati traction control system built in. 
It's similar to the one used on the race bikes, except that instead of cutting the spark, it changes the fuel mapping and retards the ignition. That's because if you cut the spark straight out like the race bikes do, unburned fuel gets fired out through the exhaust and it ruins your catalyzer. The next two days were a bit drier, so I got the chance to open it up a bit more. Holy moly, it might have nice manners on a partial throttle, but it goes absolutely bananas if you give it a bit of stick. The motor's a forward-facing L-twin, and like all Ducatis, the valves are desmodromic, meaning that they're opened and closed mechanically, instead of using valve springs. So they can run a pretty extreme cam profile without worrying that the springs won't be able to keep up. The Desmo valves are a bit clattery, and couple that with the dry clutch and open clutch cover on our demo bike, and the 1198 makes quite a racket at standstill through its twin underseat exhausts. To a Ducati nut, that's music. To the uninitiated, it's almost as if they made an excellent engine and then left some bits out. The motor pulls like a dormitory full of schoolboys up to a bit past 10,000 RPM, and the engine feels so smooth and composed at the top of the rev range that you kind of get the sense that it's hardly even trying. For that reason, you tend to bounce off the rev limiter a bit. Well, that is when you've got enough open road in front of you. It feels massively faster on the road than an inline four, and here's why. Check out this dyno chart for the Honda CBR1000. It's got a beautiful smooth power curve all the way up to 156 rear wheel horsepower at just past 12,000 RPM. Now, let's overlay the 1198's power curve. From the time the Honda wakes up at 4,500 RPM, all the way up until the Duke tapers off at 10,000 RPM, the Ducati's belting out between 15 and 25 more horsepower everywhere. The torque is just enormous, it's unavoidable and you can enjoy just about all of it under the speed limit. The 1198 gets a lovely smooth six-speed gearbox, although God knows why. At road speeds, fifth and sixth gears are not just comically redundant, they actually feel like they might be damaging the bike. Put it in top gear at 100 k's an hour, and it feels like it's gonna rattle itself to bits. Fourth feels much more composed, and in fact I only ever selected Top Gear on the highway out of some sort of sense of environmental guilt. The gearing in general is pretty tall. You do spend a lot of time slipping the clutch in first and second, and that's all you're ever going to need around town. But then it's hard to say that a bike's overgeared when it happily wheelies without a hint of clutch in first, second and third. <laughs> One of the small joys of riding the 1198 is looking down at that gorgeous dash. It's just awesome. Everything's in the right place, it's perfectly visible during the day, and it's an absolute pleasure to glance down at when you're riding in the dark. More importantly, it's the same dash that you see on Sundays on the telly when you get a glimpse over Casey Stoner or Nori Hager's shoulder. It's hard to look down at that dash and not feel just a little bit special. The bike's handling is just as magnificent as you'd expect. It turns in easily and gives you wild amounts of lead angle to explore. Some sports bikes can feel kind of hard and unfriendly until you really start showing them who's boss, but our test bike with its standard adjustable shower suspension seemed happy at any level I wanted to ride at. It felt compliant and relaxed whether I was tiptoeing around a wet mossy corner or throwing it into a fast sweeper. The R and S models both feature Olin suspension which is sure to be superb but the standard 1198 suspension was really impressive on the road. A quick look at the brakes. They're Brembo monoblock calipers with a radial master cylinder. They're massively powerful and they deliver plenty of feel, but honestly, they really rule the bike out for beginners. If you panic and grab that lever, even if it's just with two fingers, they will put you on your bum. Enough said. In one three-day test, the 1198 jumped straight to the top of my list of uncomfortable, impractical sports bikes that I'd just love to own. It's got all the crazy speed and amazing handling you expect from a road superbike. It's got class and style and, and presence in Ferrari quantities. It's got pretty crap headlights and it chews fuel, but who cares? Most importantly, it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's got a real sense of fun about it. 
where some superbikes can feel a bit too serious about their job. So the road bike's a cracker, but let's take a look at what the Xerox Ducati Corsa race team has done with it. Ducati's two factory riders this year are the Italian Michel Fabrizio and the evergreen Japanese scrapper Nitro Noriyuki Haga, who started the 2010 season as the betting favourite for the title. Um, how close is his bike to the production bike, the one that, that you buy? Closer than everybody thinks. Mm. Um, in Ducati, we have a very strong philosophy that we are racing to improve the production model. And uh, I think uh, it's very easy if you, if you can put all the production bike next to the racing bike here on the paddock. You'll really see very easily that the Ducati is the closest one to the production models. Because of the weird World Superbike rules that let 1200cc twins run against 1000cc fours, it's actually very close indeed. In fact, the stock bike breathes a little better because it doesn't have the 50mm air restrictors mandated on the race bike. Engine upgrades have juiced another 30 horsepower out of the Superbike, bringing it up to around 200 horsepower at its higher 11,000 RPM rev limit. But surprisingly, the weight is almost identical. We have a fixed uh, weight that is 168, that actually very close to the stock bike. Um, we don't run any ballast, but basically we don't uh, we don't uh, we don't make all the components extremely light, just because you don't have to. Basically, due to the to the regulation that we have six kilo more than the four cylinder. The superbike suspension is handled by Olins just like the S and R model street bikes, although they're higher spec units, of course. Uh, you can see the front fork that is basically changing from a TTX 20 to a TTX 25. It's a bigger displacement fork and it's been a uh, uh, nice improvement, especially on the brakes. Uh, always regards the, also regarding the suspension, the new shock is called RSP40. It's a new technology because uh, it's a bit, it's, um, bigger displacement too, 40 in place of 36 of last year, but the biggest news is that it's got a separate rebound compression that can only affect the top of the stroke where the top of the spring is working, so basically help it out on the braking um, area. And because Ducati is such a small family, the race teams and the production bike team are constantly working together to make changes and design aftermarket parts that'll improve both the race bike and the street bike. We have all the chain of the accessories that we sell to the dealers that is exactly the same parts that we fit on our office machine. As a foot bag, exhaust pipe or whatever, if you buy a, a full exhaust pipe you system for your 1198, it's exactly the same exhaust that you see, you know, those guys put them together here. So yeah, those sweet looking featherweight termies are just a swipe of your credit card away. We didn't get a chance to ride the 1198 on a racetrack, but if you're the kind that likes to blow the cobwebs out on the odd track day, there's not a lot of machinery out there that'd be more fun to throw at a ripple strip. Even if you're not a patch on these blokes, you'd be giving the bike a measure of the respect it deserves and a welcome breakout from the life so many Ducati sports bikes seem to end up leading. Huge thanks to Ducati City, NF Importers, Fraser Motorcycles, Noel McKeegan, Darren Quick, Mike Hanlon, Fab Fitzgerald, Ingrid Ropers, Leanne Fusanato, Ernesto Marinelli, and this guy who for some reason doesn't want to be named. <laughs>